you love Demi Moore and Ghost, you'll love her even more with Rob Lowe in About Last Night. It's about sex. I was pretty drunk last night. Did anything happen? No, absolutely nothing. Want to do it again? It's about risk. I think maybe you ought to have a drawer. A drawer? A whole drawer? It's about honesty. Did you sleep with them? No, Dan, we were bowling partners. It's about last night. Do you want me to stay? Rob Lowe and Demi Moore, two of Hollywood's best, 8.30 Friday on Channel 9. Sunday, a tribute to the Crabs, tragically killed earlier this month while studying the awesome power of volcanoes. It's like watching the creation of the Earth itself. This is their life's work in one spectacular Our World premiere. Their goal, to document the great eruptions of our time. 6.30 Sunday on Channel 9. Oh, the accountant rang. Just finished the books. We've survived the first year, love. Hmm, we rich yet? Not exactly, but we're okay. It's our own business, up and running. Yep, we're running, 24 hours a day. Michael Lloyd, age 30. Married, one child, mortgage. We're really proud of your son, your own boss. You can't beat it. Michael's challenge, to reduce tax and build a nest egg for retirement. Oh, if I'd known what was involved, I'd never have taken it on. Rubbish, Mike. Boats are your life. Rent, wages, lease equipment, it never stops. Yeah, yeah, but with your name on the door. Well, the door's still open and we're growing. Decision? Invest $230 per month into National Mutual Superannuation. My daddy has lots and lots of boats. Result? Michael's tax burden is reduced and his National Mutual agent estimates he'll receive at least half a million at age 65. National Mutual. For the most important person in the world. Good food. Good health. With Lenore Smith. Entertaining is great fun. Especially if you serve healthy food. Even desserts can be nutritious. Nowadays, there are plenty of options that are good for your guests. A cheese platter like this has the right sort of balance. Fruit, veggies, crackers and bread, and cheese. A top finish to a great meal, even if I do say so myself. Brought to you by the Australian Dairy Corporation. Magnifique. Ça, c'est un pinot noir chardonnay. Alors là, je ne me trompe jamais. Un arôme pareil. I get so homesick. Hardy Sir James. <laughs> oh non, 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 c'est pas possible, ça. Hardy Sir James Cuvée Bird. A fine champagne in anyone's language. Thought I was asleep, didn't you? No way. I'm staying awake until every last Magna Encore wagon is sold. And that shouldn't take long. Hey! Because right now, the Magna Encore wagon is selling for just $19,990. This is my ad! Including power steering and four-wheel disc brakes, headlamp guards, cargo security blind, cloth-trimmed seating for five adults... What about me? ...and air conditioning. Who turned that on? Who's responsible? Because everyone has a lot of stuff to store, IKEA has just the place to stick your stuff. So now, when someone else wants to charge you more for somewhere to stick your stuff, you can tell them where to stick it. If you're in business, ask yourself this question. If you're not prominent in the yellow pages, how are people going to find you? Advertising in Telecom Yellow Pages works. To be in it, call this number. This program is proudly sponsored by the new Mazda 121 and ANZ Funds Management. A tune that reminds me of my youth. Hello, and in tonight's program, Mr. Hawke carries the day in a caucus confrontation over the ban on mining at Coronation Hill in Kakadu National Park. Churchman turned politician Fred Nile suddenly finds he has the whip hand in the New South Wales Upper House. The car we've all been dreaming of, it runs on water. Well, hydrogen to be specific. And also tonight I'll be chatting with an author whose name is Maggie Smythe about payment for housework. What? 
a woman is worth. They will find out, but I think we'll find out the women are worth more than we blokes think they are. Well, Mr Hawke spent this evening putting his case to caucus on why he pushed for a ban on mining at Coronation Hill in Kakadu National Park. It was tipped to be a pretty boisterous session, with some backbenchers upset at the decision. But Mr Hawke came up smelling like a rose. Cabinet's decision not to mine at Coronation Hill was debated for just over an hour by Federal caucus before the Prime Minister and his supporters emerged claiming victory. Overwhelming support. Are you happy this is the end of the issue? Well, I'm with always the happy with overwhelming support. Is it the end of the issue in caucus now? Yes. Fairly predictable, I think. The Prime Minister won the day. Graham Campbell, who led the push for a caucus debate over Cabinet's decision, claims the meeting was one-sided. By some quirk, uh, we got uh, a lot more speakers uh, supporting the government uh, identified and therefore they got a much better part at the cherry. Cabinet's mining ban on Coronation Hill was never actually put to the vote. Instead, the caucus endorsement was carried by voices. And that was clearly not to everyone's satisfaction. Some people who felt that there were other things that should have been taken into consideration apart from simply the Aboriginal view. But government sensitivity over Coronation Hill saw opposition leader John Hewson gagged when he tried to move a resolution, calling on the Prime Minister to explain. Why well, he imposed on his cabinet the totally irrational and hypocritical decision to prohibit further mining at Coronation Hill. The Mr Speaker, the House. let's be clear. No longer heard. The question is... Oh. Oh. Okay, well, the Prime Minister is not only a liar, but he's a coward as well. In answer to criticism of the no mine decision, Mr. Hawke has tried to reassure mining companies that Coronation Hill is a one off issue. This is not an anti mining government, as been indicated by a number of decisions. Cathy Swan, The World Tonight. Did we have what's a caucus chair? It's, the word is chairman. I'll tell you why it's chairman and not chairperson or chairwoman. The word chairman means as different from an ape or an orangutan or a snake. It means man, as in mankind. It doesn't mean man, as in bloke, right? That's why we don't use the expression chairperson or chairwoman or chair. She's a chairman. Thank you. Nice to hear the truth occasionally, isn't it? All those silly people going on. It's nothing to do with sexism at all. It is if you want it to be, but it isn't. How are you? A couple of days to go. Is it Thursday today? whether to believe you or not. Well, there's a bit of a mystery going on in Tasmania. Premier Michael Field has ordered government departments to give confidential documents to a police investigation involving state politicians and leading public figures. Now, according to police, the investigation concerns possible breaches of various Tasmanian Acts of Parliament. But that's all they're giving away at this stage. Mr Field said he has not been interviewed by police in relation to the inquiry and said he doesn't know what the investigation involves. However, it's not believed to be directly related to the current Carter Royal Commission, which is investigating the state's 1989 political bribery scandal. Wouldn't you think someone would ask them what it is, just as a matter of courtesy? Nice little non-item there. Virtuous politician come morals campaigner Fred Nile has won the balance of power in the New South Wales Upper House. He's claiming victory for the final spot in the Legislative Council and he's demanding big concessions from the government in return for his support. He has taken his morals cause into the lion's den that is King's Cross. Now Fred Nile's political crusade has made him one of the most powerful members of Parliament. After final counting of preferences, the Reverend Nile appears to have regained his Legislative Council seat by the narrowest of margins from Green candidate Ian Cohen. That means with his support and his wife Elaine, who make up the Call to Australia party, the government has won control of the 42-seat upper house. The question is, at what price? I don't believe that uh, minor parties or independents should block a government from governing. But that does not mean that Mr Griner has a blank cheque from uh, Fred Nile. In fact, just as Tamworth independent Tony Windsor has done a deal in the lower house, today Fred Nile produced his own demands he says the government must meet for its majority. Demands that include conscience votes on issues such as abortion and an undertaking that Mr Griner will back down on Sydney's proposed casino. If that's a, an issue in which uh, Mr Griner wants to negotiate, there's no room for negotiation. I'm totally, absolutely opposed to it. Providing it meets strict controls, the irony is that the government should be able to push through its casino bill with the help of the opposition. The danger for the coalition is that it may have to guess the Nile's support on other crucial legislation unless it enters some formal agreement. 
All of which underlines the Griner government's precarious hold on power. It's a government that, that depends on the support of an independent in the lower house and Fred Nile in the upper house. And I think that'll fill a lot of people with, uh, with dread. Late today, the Premier's only comment was that he'd be happy to speak to Mr Nile. I wonder what Mr Carr meant by that. Now, more than 1,100 passengers aboard the cruise line of Fairstar are to be flown back to Australia after being stranded in the South China Sea. The ship was three days out of Singapore, bound for Hong Kong, when its power failed after both the ship's boilers became contaminated with salt water. Oh, a little diagram. Isn't that lovely? Um, an ocean-going tug is now towing the Fair Star, it's both coloured red, to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. The ship left Singapore on Monday after a $5 million 12-day refit and was sailing to Sydney via Hong Kong and Japan. And on that subject, a New Zealand tug is heading towards a Chinese container ship uh, whose engine failed in big seas on Tuesday south of the Pacific Island of Numea, where I have relatives, because I'm partly French. Did you know that? The tug is expected to rendezvous with the ship about midnight tomorrow night and have drinks with it and chat about old sea time. The wheel went down well last night. I saw a bit of an experiment. I can't say I was in awe of the whole wheel thing, but uh, people said, we liked it. Will you do it occasionally? I said, well, it's only ever going to be an occasional thing. So there you are. Funny how the plane flew off. I, I rather like that. I mean, the wheel, the one, the one little diagram that was the plane. It just flew away. I think there's a certain sort of joy in things like that that tickles my fancy. Well, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines is erupting again. 50% of U.S. Air Force personnel will be pulled out of the Philippines. The decision to withdraw the airmen indicates the heavy damage to Clark Air Base and that it may take some time before the installation can be made operational again. 4,500 Air Force personnel who were stationed at Clark will leave Friday by ship to a central Philippine island and from there travel by air to the United States. The Air Force pullout will leave only 2,500 airmen in the Philippines, 1,500 at Clark, and a thousand at Subic. The units at Clark were left behind to guard the facility after the other 15,000 Americans there were evacuated to Subic on June 10th. The evacuation does not affect U.S. Navy and Marine Corps personnel at Subic. The evacuation of military dependents continued. As officials said, they hope to complete the evacuation of the 20,000 servicemen's families this week. Meanwhile, Mount Pinatubo erupted again in a series of explosions that ejected ash and steam. Ash fell over Clark Air Base and nearby Angela City. This area was one of the worst to be stricken by deadly ash fall from the mountain. The government said that although the latest eruptions were weakening, the volcano remains active. The government has declared a state of calamity in these areas. And indeed, an estimated 6,000 to 7,000 tonnes of volcanic ash has covered the Australian Merchants Navy's largest ship. That's a lot, six to seven thousand tons. Leaving it stranded in dry dock just 22 kilometres from the Philippines erupting Mount Pinatuba. None of the 28 crew members has been hurt. Um, Martin Byrne of the Mar Marine Engineers Union says the crew is living aboard the vessel because all local hotel accommodation has collapsed under the weight of the wind-blown ash. The 235,000 ton plus the 7,000 ton of volcanic ash, Iron Pacific, flagship of the BHP fleet, is expected to remain in dry dock, extremely dry, I would imagine, at Subic Bay in the Philippines all month during mop-up operations. Actually, it's not mop-up. That's a silly journalistic. You don't mop up, mop up wet things. It's dry. What would you call it? Sweep up? Broom up? Cleaner? Vacuum? No, I'm not happy with any of that. I'm sorry. We're going to go on to get a better expression. Hoover up. J. Edgar up. All right, J. Edgar up. Sounds like a country town in Western Australia. They're all ups. Mop up. They're flexible journalists, aren't they? Sad thing is some of them are actually allowed to reproduce and have baby journalists. Well, coming up a little later tonight... Uh, at last, a car that runs sort of on water. And one of these news stories after the break will be the surrender of one of the world's richest men. His name is Pablo Escobar. He's also a bastard, a drug baron and murderer. <laughs>
It's good, clean fun. Mazda 121. You'll want one too. ANZ Personal Investment Products make investing so easy to understand, the penny is sure to drop. Talk to your financial advisor or drop into ANZ to see one of ours. Brashes, CD and cassette price avalanche is on. Prices have plummeted on a great range of CDs from a low $7.95. $7.95, that's unbelievable. Cassettes have dropped way, way down from as low as $5.95. Don't miss the CD and cassette price avalanche. Hurry to Brashes. Look at the computing power. But where is it when you need it? Right here, on the line with you. Toshiba Computers. Financial control. Greater connectivity. Faster learning. Better management. Toshiba. More computing tools to work on the line, wherever you are. The power center of business. You line one up for yourself. Brody Lighthouse, Australia's largest lighting retailer, is turning on a massive sale and prices are really crashing. Down lights from an incredible 650. Directionals from a low 1995. Exteriors also from 1995. Tiffany's from 4995 and three light pendants from just 3995. Prices have really crashed on quick fix lights. Now from a tiny $2.95. So hurry into Brody before all the lights go out. anything better than getting the family together around a hot so sourcing sponge pudding by white wings when they've got white wings mom they've got it made perfect in ovens or microwaves Friday 7.30, a beautiful home you don't see every day. And it belongs to Nolene Hogan now listen, where's the tennis court? plus lots more informative entertainment in Berg's Backyard on 9 well, with friends like the Americans, who needs enemies to stab us in the back? Australian farmers are accusing the Americans of going back on their word over sales of subsidised wheat to Kuwait. The United States agreed not to operate in our traditional Middle East markets, but says Kuwait doesn't count. The American move on our wheat market in Kuwait has started alarm bells ringing in Canberra. It's not so much this actual wheat sale, but one, its implications for the rest of the Middle Eastern market, and secondly, that this might be the beginning of a post-war strategy by the United States in the Middle East. The United States is heavily subsidising its wheat. The 100,000 tonnes on offer to the Kuwaiti government undercuts Australian wheat by between 30 and 40 US dollars a tonne and the American government is under continuing pressure from its powerful farming lobby. And unless we can stop these wheat subsidies, the longer term effect of that is that the Australian wheat industry will contract because we simply can't match those subsidies. Half Australia's wheat exports goes to the Middle East. In the Gulf War aftermath, as Australia tried to re-establish in the battered marketplace, the Americans signalled they intended to move in with subsidised grains. Prime Minister Hawke sought and won a personal guarantee from President Bush that Australia's traditional markets would be protected. That pledge now is being seriously questioned. It does raise the whole question of what the future policy is going to be uh, for larger sales in the Middle East and it does raise the question of the value of assurances uh, to us by the United States. The Americans aren't bothering with too many apologies. They say getting into Kuwait had little to do with Australia. It was all about beating the Europeans to the punch. Peter Harvey. Okay. Uh, to get a sort of perspective on uh, the indulgence of human beings, uh, the United States drug policy chief says Americans spent up to $65 billion on illicit drugs just last year. The biggest sellers were cocaine at $23 billion and heroin $16 billion, as much as they can estimate, considering they can't catch the people that sell and therefore the people that buy. So you could add a bit onto that, unless that's the add-on a bit type estimation. It says a lot for mankind, doesn't it? And Prime Minister Hawke has told President George Bush the US has breached the spirit of assurances it gave Australia earlier this year. Mr Hawke's letter was sent to the President today and should reach him in about six months. Why'd you write a letter?
Boris Yeltsin's uh, big, stern Russian face has at last cracked into a grin as he enjoys the sort of welcome the United States usually reserves for old chums. The Americans intended to restrain their greetings in order not to offend Mikhail Gorbachev back home. But they just can't seem to help themselves. Boris mania has arrived. A 10-gallon hat and a hand tool belt with Boris on it were the perfect gifts because Congress treated him as if John Wayne had come calling. It fits all sizes. His mission, he explained, was a humble one. Oh, really? I want them to understand me. About what? A joke. Oh, really? To understand what is Russia and where it is heading. Of course, he wants a lot more than that, but Washington just loves a winner, especially a landslide winner. So this was the picture everyone wanted to be in. And for a while there, you'd have thought George Washington was back. He is young. He is tireless. And time and again, he had just the message to bring them to their feet. Indicates that there is no really going back in Russia and in the Soviet Union on the path of reform. Congress got so comfortable with him, they gave him an assignment. We, we would like to encourage more direct contact with the Republic rather than the central government. And I hope you make that point with President Bush. This is why I've come here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not until they gave him a small souvenir did he underscore the real reason for his visit. I hope this is not the first installment of your assistance. I can feel by its weight that this is not a piece of gold bullion. By mid-afternoon, he was turning his charm on the rest of Washington. A smash at every stop, he began to look like he was running for office here. It will be harder tomorrow when he goes to the White House. Like many of Yeltsin's new friends, the president wants to help the Soviet democracy movement too, but must figure out how to do it without offending Gorbachev. I'm not convinced about the accuracy of those translations. It does, having watched SBS for some years, middly with the sound off most of the time, you get to get be suspicious after a while. The world would be a better place if Pablo Escobar was shot or fell under a bus or something menial like that. Escobar, who is Colombia's most feared drug lord, is believed to be responsible for most of the killings in the drug wars there for the past decade. But he's found a cushy way out of his murderous fight with the government. He's surrendered to authorities, but on his terms. Pablo Escobar gave up to authorities on a rooftop in downtown Medellin, the capital of his cocaine empire. A quiet surrender in stark contrast to the violence and terror that gripped Colombia during Escobar's eight years as a fugitive. Last seen in public in 1983, the billionaire drug lord built a cartel that supplied 80% of the cocaine sold in the United States and Europe. A business Escobar protected with ruthless zeal. A presidential candidate and a government minister are among the thousands who fell victim to Escobar's terrorist squads. Today, as Escobar was flown into custody, the government was claiming it had won the war. There is no doubt that this is a clear victory for Colombia which has done the most uh, in this war against narco-trafficking. But it can hardly be seen as a victory for justice. Escobar surrendered on his own terms. The government allowed him to choose his own jail, a former drug rehabilitation centre converted into a prison exclusively for Escobar. And he only gave himself up after Colombia's parliament passed a law saving drug traffickers from extradition to the United States. Here in the US, Escobar is wanted on at least nine charges of drug trafficking and murder. Officials here say he would have received much harsher punishment from American courts than he stands to get at home. Everybody says it's a given, extradition is gone. They're debating whether to pardon these guys. You know, uh, that would be a terrible mistake. That's easy for an American to say, but Colombians point out they're the ones who've suffered most in the drug war. A nation weary of bloodshed has decided that being lenient on its criminals is the only way to bring peace. But while the violence might stop, and even with Escobar behind bars, his cartel is not likely to go out of business. Nor are the other cartels. Not as long as there's a thriving world market for Colombia's biggest export. In the United States, Stephen Penley, World Tonight. Well, of course, when you have a market like $65 billion potential in the United States alone in one year, you're hardly likely to not be professional about your demise. Because I, I keep thinking, why doesn't someone from the CIA, no CIA knock him off? But 
Saddam Hussein is still alive. So much for their efficiency. Well, now to finance. And today there were sharp falls prompted by slumps in the overseas markets. The All Ordinaries was down, but the Nikkei Dow closed with a modest gain after a three-day slide. London is down in a day of limp trading, but gold is up and the Australian dollar also closed somewhat firmer. Coming up after the break, uh, Maggie Smythe. And how much is a woman worth? A 626 hatch. Appreciate its impressive list of features and superior level of comfort. At $27,950, including air conditioning, the Mazda 626 Sports Hatch will take you by surprise. For the very first time on television, a commercial with a coupon. This will allow you to get in really fast for the new issue of Safe, Secure Telecom Bonds. Offering up to 11.5% per annum. So, fill in the telecom bonds coupon and send to... Oh, looks like some smart investor has just beaten you to it. You can get another from Westpac or by phoning now. Who grew up flying the mail over vast distances back in the 20s? Who has one of the most respected names in international travel with an enviable record of service and reliability? Who flies one of the world's largest fleets of 747-400s to Europe, America and Asia? Who but Northwest, the American airline tipped to be number one, flying from Australia, July 3. Domus presents the biggest lighting stock take clearance sale ever. Strauss crystal chandeliers less than wholesale from $45. Banker's lamp $35. Security lights $35. Low voltage down lights a ridiculous $4. Eyeball $7. Low voltage spotlights incredible value $12. Pull down pendants $39. Four light glass panel pendants $69. Domus stock clearance sale is on for two weeks only. Trade welcome. Domus lighting 665 Forest Road Bexley open Saturday and Sunday. Happy anniversary. Here's to another 18 years. With David! <laughs> <laughs> and did you hear that Marcus has bought a terrace house in Auckland? Oh, really? I'm going there next week myself with... Smoked salmon, please. I just love the shoes you bought. Yes, they'll be perfect for sailing on the harbour on a magic 60-footer. This is like a small Garden of Eden. We have wheat on this side, beans on this side. Tomorrow night, the $100 million biosphere, a desert dress rehearsal for colonizing other worlds. If the planet goes up, some of us are going to get out of here. A Current Affair, tomorrow, 6.30, following National 9 News at 6. I received a resume of a United Nations report today which stated that the role of Australian women in economic life was substantially lower than some of their European counterparts. It also says that in spite of some improvements, substantial disparities still distance women from men in Australia. What a quaint way of saying it. Now, I suppose one could ask why women put up with it, but I'm not a woman and I don't know. Maggie Smythe is one and has just produced a compendium of books for not just women but everyone. They cover women's unpaid work, managing work and home, women and paid work, returning to work, looking at the childcare options and financial security. Maggie Smythe is a working mother, a trained social worker, a woman who studied law and a teacher. A busy woman. You could say that. This isn't your life history, is it? It's not a biography in some way, is it? <laughs> These booklets, yes. you mean? a bit. A bit, yes. I'm sure there's bits, elements of it in there. So, so what prompted this? I mean... Well, part of the reason for it was there's an enormous amount of information. There are millions of reports on lots of shelves written in incredibly academic language that ordinary women never, ever get to see. Yeah. There are also some things written that are so simple they don't really tell anyone anything or discuss anything in a sort of useful way. So what we were trying to do was pull together some of that information in a simple way that ordinary, everyday women who are very busy and don't have time to read huge, thick reports could read. You know, I had a, quite a heated discussion with um, Jane, who does a lot of research. She's terrific. Right. 
And I realized that within myself, there's a lot of things I'd never resolved. And I had become, I had perpetuated prejudices and I don't know where I got them from, perhaps right. the 60s and 50s. But it does seem also, uh, the natural reaction with all this is to blame someone, isn't it? That's Somehow, right. I blame you lot for not getting your act together. I feel better and it's your fault. That's exactly uh, right. Yes, yes. agreed. Yeah. Uh, and I suddenly, while I was talking to her, I was suddenly realizing that, for example, say I work with you and I work with a man and you're both inept in your job. Right. I would dispense with him in my own way, but you would annoy me more for some reason because you're a woman, yet you're both inept, yet I have it out on you more yep. than I have it out on him. Yep. And this psychology aspect of it, does anyone look at that? I think people are starting to more and more, and that affects not just you know, relations between men and women, but if you just think simply, I can think back to when I was, for example, 17 and thinking what I'd do when I left school, it never occurred to me in a million years that I could have gone and been a lawyer or a doctor or an architect. But why didn't it? Because I was brought up in a world where all around me women were... They were either at home looking after children. If they went to work, they either worked in jobs like nursing, teaching, social welfare, sort of looking after people jobs, or else they worked cutting sandwiches, serving in shops, doing those sorts of things. So your expectations so, were limited by your experience. And I didn't recognise yeah. that at the time. I had What changed it? Because you did go... Uh Got to do law, didn't you? That's right. Well, what, what changed it for me was beginning to look at that and think about that and think, now, wait just one minute, why can't I do that? Mm. And it was lucky for me that I thought about that in the early 80s when I actually had an option to do that. Yeah. Um, if I'd thought about that in the 50s, yes. I would have just thought about it. It would have been a nice idea. I, I see as a male, and I can only speak, f in fact, that's unfair. I see as me, yep. I happen to be a male. Yep. A real problem with, the, with the young ladies I've worked with over the years, a lot of them aren't given... I'll start again. I don't have a secondary choice in my life. I only have a career. I can't opt out, and some do opt out, and have a baby if my job bores me. And I've worked with a lot of ladies who, in their early 20s, are having really no hope of jobs, and you can see what they're going to do. Whether they arrange to have no hope of jobs or it evolved that way, they'll meet Mr Wright or whatever, marry and have babies, and that will be a, a change of direction. Is it possible that women still, with the best of intentions of the world, still really don't careers take careers as seriously because they know they can opt out and have babies? See, men don't have that choice. I think it's certainly true that a lot of women don't think about their work as a career. We know that women are going to spend 27 years in paid work in the years between 15 and 65. Most women don't think about it like that. The time they start thinking about that is when they're in their late 30s and early 40s, then they start thinking, now, wait a minute, I've been working all these years and what am I going to do next? So, so uh, perhaps having children is not necessarily the greatest fulfilling thing for a woman then, is it? I think what a lot of women are saying is, yes, they do want to have children, but in fact, most women now will have around two children. Mm. Those children are not young forever. Mm. And for a lot of women, that's part of their life, a really important part, but it's not everything. And there's lots of other things they want to do. They often discover that too late, don't they? Well, that's right. And, yes. the, and the difficulty, I think, for women is that often the way that we look at work is very much about you, you start out in something in your early 20s and you stay in it mm. and you continue in it. Now, if what you've done is worked in a few different jobs, then you've taken some time out to have children and when you're 35, you think to yourself... You're disqualified, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Nobody takes any account of the unpaid work you've done as yeah. giving you skills. You've brought up that point of unpaid. Um, you refer to the fact that w women uh, uh, present the greatest mass of unpaid workers in Australia. That's right. Well, what do you, well, what's the implication there? What's the inference I should draw? Do you feel they should be paid or recognised? I don't or think what? it's necessarily that. I think, firstly, that they ought to be, that work ought to be recognised. How do you recognise it? Well, for a start, you could look at recognising it economically. You could look at actually counting that unpaid work in the national ca accounts or in the wealth of the country. You're not suggesting Hubby actually gives her money for what she does. Well, it wouldn't necessarily wouldn't... need to happen in that way. But I mean... he wouldn't rule it out if he wants to do that. Oh, if he wants to do that. What about Hubby helping a bit more? I mean, I think that's the crucial thing. And when you actually look, for example, at a recent study done by Michael Bittman, what you find is that really men don't do a great deal more in the actual house. If they are doing work in the house, it's really work on the car or the pool or something like yeah. that. And there's quite an interesting table in one of these booklets that looks at women's unpaid work once they have a child. That shoots up high and stays up there for a long time. For men, their work doesn't necessarily increase at all when a child comes along in the family. Now, why 
Do you think that is? Even we're supposedly liberated, and perhaps that's the fallacy. Well, I Why think do men hard. still feel that? It's almost blaming women for what they've done, isn't it? That's mm. your baby. Mm. You've got to carry the baby, isn't it? Yeah. Why? Yeah. I'll carry the photographs, you carry yes. the baby. And it's a lot like that. I think, well, I think there's a few reasons for that. One is, in terms of men's careers, that's a time in their life when their amount of hours in paid work goes up, mm. so they're spending more time at work. Secondly, a lot of men don't actually know anything about babies. They haven't had a lot to do with them. It's not that complicated, is it? To say, can I help? Well, I mean, it, it would be simple it, were they to actually see that it's work. I think for a lot of men they don't see that it, there is actually work involved. They spend time playing with their children mm. more often now um, and sometimes spend more time minding the children, but they'll actually be just minding the children. They won't be minding the children cooking the dinner, doing the washing and all those sorts of things It really as is well. hard work, is it? I think looking after children, while it can be a great experience, is also physically quite difficult work. It's very long hours, there's a lot of demands on you, and particularly when you're looking at people who've got two or three or four children, yes. especially under five or six, I mean, that's an enormous <laughs> amount of work. Actually, I have one final thought on this. When my mother died about three or four years ago, she had no money at all. Right. And I wonder, do you look at the situation where a, w a woman regardless of what happens, say well, her husband dies first yep. or there's a, yep. a divorce, how does she get some security if she's not paid for all those years at home? Well, that's the real difficulty for women when you look at if you've spent, on average, 23 years of your life in unpaid work, and for a lot of women it was all of their adult life, and you look at the women who are on the aged pension and that's their total source of yes. income, it's an insult, you find it? there's an enormous number of women there. Yeah. And that's where the link between unpaid work and paid work and income security needs to be made. So we really think about what does that mean for women in the future? Especially because they live now. I mean, I'm likely to live till I'm 80 if I right. eat the right things. And so the old, the old line about keep them penniless pr and pregnant in the kitchen hasn't changed too much, has it? Well, I, it's... Not really, has it? It's changed to a certain extent. Well, then the people don't admit it, it now, but I mean, I, I, it seems to me that um, security, the insecurity that my mother had, I mean, she died with nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, that's true. All right, well, um, the books are available uh, free? They're free it's from nice the word, Women's Advisory it? Council. Women's yeah. Advisory, so if ladies want to get it, or men, I should say, when I hear my mink sex, every, anyone wants anyone to Anyone who wants word, a yes, copy it could ring the Women's Advisory Council. What's their number? 561... This is Sydney, isn't it? Yes, Sydney. 02, 56 one yes. double eight four zero. Double eight four zero. And if they want the whole set, there's yes. a handling fee. And but... right. Um, well, so what are they asking for, then? What are the books They're about? asking for a series called Women and Work. Women and Work. All right. Thank you for that. I did expect to have a happy ending to all this, but I imagine that's in the future somewhere, isn't it? Well, that's right. <laughs> Maggie Smythe. And there are the books. There are, uh, I think it's seven and all. And they're not just for women. They're for everyone. And things should change. And I said it. I'll be back after this. ANZ insurance products make insurance so easy to understand, the penny is sure to drop. Talk to your financial advisor or drop into ANZ to see one of ours. If you're in business, ask yourself this question. If you're not prominent in the yellow pages, how are people going to find you? Advertising in Telecom Yellow Pages works. To be in it, call this number.
as a result of it, he's been She needs protection. What's he taking? What's this? He's all right, is he? Give me a little bit of something just to see where you went. And I can make a door for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah.